Hi, this is Sean Wildermuth. Here's another short video where I'm going to show you some things in Visual Studio that I like to do, and uh, hopefully you'll get some benefit out of it. In this little video, we're going to be talking about refactoring and building classes. Now, we're actually not going to be talking about refactoring existing classes. We're going to be talking about using refactoring to build up your classes as you write code. This is a pattern I've gotten really comfortable with, and I thought I'd show you a couple of different techniques that I like to use. One note is I'm not using any extensions to make any of this stuff works. This is all bare bones in Visual Studio. This works in Visual Studio uh, Community Edition all the way up to the Ultimate Editions. And uh, this has existed in Visual Studio for quite a long time. So none of it should be super new or specific to Visual Studio 2015. Uh, and hopefully I can show you uh, some neat little tricks. The first thing I want to talk about is just simply creating types. Over here in Visual Studio, let me uh, move this a little out of my way. I've just got a console app and nothing's really started yet. And normally if I need some class, let's say I have people class, I might go and create a new file for that people class and build it people class and then come back here and use it. But my pattern lately in the last few years has been really to let's see how it's used and go ahead and create it from there. So let me show you a couple ways you can do that. So if I start something like, let's say I want a person and there's, let's say I want to create a new person class, I might go ahead and instantiate a new person there. And you'll notice the squiggly line I get there or the nice quick action I get there is going to allow me to do a couple of things. Could let me generate the class in a new file. It gives you a little preview of what it's going to look like. Generate a person class. And this won't be in a new file. It'll be directly in this file, which I almost never do. Same with nested class. I almost never create nested classes inside of other classes. Or there's this generate new type. Let's start with the generate a person in a new file. When I did this, we'll see that this become a good type because it actually created a new file over here called person, which I can then start to use and start to build up. But one of the interesting things, I'm going to delete this person class for a second and let's watch it fail again, is I'm going to go ahead and generate a new type, which is this bottom option. This is one that a lot of people don't actually see if they are using the refactoring. And that is this generate type dialog. And sometimes I want to have some structure to what I'm doing and I want to be able to make some different decisions. Like I want to make sure it's public and I want to make sure that it's a struct instead of a class, those sort of decisions. Decisions. And this gives you that moment to be able to make some of those decisions. The one that I use the most actually is, is putting in a subdirectory. So I could do something like my uh, data sla uh, backslash person, and we'll go ahead and create the directory as well as the name for me. And if I've done everything correct, you notice it even threw it in that data namespace for me. And so that sometimes is a useful technique to uh, create a class without just going ahead and quickly creating it and then having to change, go over and change some of those options. I use both of those pretty liberally. Sometimes I go ahead and just create the class. Sometimes I go ahead and use the dialog, depending on what I need. The next thing is using snippets to create properties. If you've watched any of my uh, courses or you've watched me at conferences, you've probably seen me do this quite a lot. And this is where when we navigate over to our properties, and if you don't know the hotkey for that, it's F12. And I have another video talking about my favorite hotkeys and that one's in there. This will take us over to the person. The snippet I'm going to use is called prop. And you'll see there's a few that start with prop. I'll show you a couple of these in a minute. But prop is the one I use most commonly. And that is to create an automatically implemented property. So if we tab, we can see that style where we have a property name and then we just have a get and a set to create that property. Now, because this is a snippet, it has these two placeholders. The first one is the type, which I'll change to string. And if I tab, I can get over to the property name, which I'll call first name. And then when I press enter, it'll complete the operation for me. And so now we have a property called first name on our object. The other props are kind of interesting. There's a, an attached dependency property. This is mostly used for WPF projects. Same for independency properties also for WPF or other XAML projects. But the last two of these are kind of interesting. Prop full creates a property. So let me show you what that looks like. 
prop full and once I hit tab it'll take me into it just like it did before with placeholders. So I'll start with a string here. I'll call my backing class first name and make sure I hit tab instead of return here will take me down to the property name which I'm going to call first name. And if I hit shift tab it'll take me back because in this case I've misnamed it and it should have been last name and you'll see it continues to fix it in all the right places hit enter, and I've got my new complete property. And this is for a full property. And prompt G, which creates a property with a public get, but a private set so that it can be set only from within the class. And I'll do this something like age, probably not a great example, but something that we can go ahead and set from within our, within our class. So being able to create and stub out your entire set of properties for an object you can do that pretty quickly with these snippets. But I'm gonna show you another technique, so I'm gonna go ahead and clear that out and leave our person class. Because the next thing I wanna do is talk about building classes based on their use instead of knowing ahead of time or going into the classes. And I do this actually a little bit even more often than using the property snippets. Now the trick here is over here where I've created my new person, if I know what I want this person to look like, I might go ahead and just instantiate it as a an object constructor or in just its use. So let's do that. Let's say I want first name to be my name. And you can probably guess what the rest of these are going to be. Don't tell anybody what that age is. And that should be good enough. And I might even step out that I want this to be able to save with the kind of success I want. Now we have all these squigglies because our person class doesn't have any of this API. But now that I've sort of written out the use I think is gonna be useful, I can go ahead and use that quick helper again and go ahead and generate these. So generate the property and this ends up being pretty quick because I can just sort of walk through, generate each of those properties and even generate the methods. And let's use F12 to head over there. And we'll see we're starting to get sort of the, the initial implementation of this. Now, I don't necessarily need internal versus public. And this might be a public class eventually. And so I might go ahead and change this. But you'll see that it guessed mostly what I wanted. It inferred the types based on the data I was sending. It even inferred the return types when I... Uh, told it that I wanted save to return an object. And we could even do something like person.initialize and give it some parameters like Sean Wildermuth 46. And when we generate that method using the same instance, over here in the class, we're gonna get that initialize method. And it's not gonna be able to usually guess what the properties are here but it will at least stub those out for me. In fact, let's get rid of this for a minute and let's use a little trick. This is one I sometimes use. And that is if the pro if we have a property name like first equals Sean, last equals Wildermuth, and age equals 46, right? If I use this to initialize first, last, age, everyone likes it, but when I generate the initialize, you'll actually see here in the preview that it is going to create it with the name of the properties that I set. And so it's going to do everything it can to try to, to create the correct version of that property for me as much as it possibly can figure out. Make sense? The next thing I want to talk about is extracting interfaces. Because when I'm starting to create classes. This happens a lot in things like repositories where I don't know what the interface needs to be. And often there's sort of two approaches here, creating and crafting what the interface should be and then implementing classes that are based on it. But I actually like to go a little bit backwards. And I'll actually use this class as an example. I might have created the structure of some properties and some methods that I want in the interface. And I might use this so that it's sort of that initial version, that first version I'm going to end up using, and then use refactoring to say, let's create an interface based on that. So if we go up here to the person class and I just hit control period, that quick 
actions uh, object, it'll say extract interface. And this is going to pop up an interesting little dialogue if you haven't seen it. And that's where I can really name the interface. And it's going to guess it's going to be I in this class name. And I can pick what parts of the API are going to be actually about that interface. So let's go ahead and get rid of the properties and really say that this is person initialization. I could make that differentiation and decide what parts of that interface are actually part of that. And for some reason that uh, is showing an error, I'm gonna enable and ignore future errors because it did go ahead and create our new interface correctly. I'm not sure why my specific version of Visual Studio is failing, but let's ignore that. This is a really easy way to go ahead and build up your interfaces from existing classes instead of always having to build the interface and then uh, instantiate it otherwise. Now, you can actually do the reverse as well. Let's assume that uh, we don't have any of those properties, but we've decided to hand build this. This is sort of the other approach, starting with the interface. When we add the interface here, I person initialization, it's going to give us another quick action, which is implement the interface. And this will look at the interface, look at all the properties and, and add to them. And the interesting part about this is if we go back here and let's say make another option like run, we can come back here, even though we've already run this to instantiate the interface, to implement the interface, we can tell it to do it again, and what it'll do, it'll add that th new option in the interface. And so I use this a lot as I expand an interface to go ahead and implement it on all the classes that need it. And so regardless of which direction you go, you're going to be able to go class first into interface or interface into class and Visual Studio will help you do both. And finally, the last one I'm going to show you is a little bit off track because it isn't as much about refactoring. I just think it's really cool and I run into this all the time. And that is I'm trying to consume some JSON piece of code and either I'm going to get it out and just sort of read it with like link for JSON or I might want to actually concrete class, classes. And this is more usually what I want. And a lot of people seem to miss that this is actually built in. Let me show you this trick. I'm going to open up Postman. And I'm using Postman here to just get at uh, a GitHub repository block. I'm essentially going and looking at my Wilder blog project at the public project and getting back some data. This is just a JSON document that they return with all the different pieces of information about that repository. So I'm going to, just going to copy this entire piece of JSON just into the, the buffer. I'm just using control C to copy it into the copy paste buffer. Back here, I'm going to open up a sort of an empty uh, class file. I can actually say edit paste special if you've never seen that, and actually paste JSON as classes. This doesn't work as well with paste XML as classes, and I haven't had a lot of good luck getting that one to work, but the one for JSON I use all the time because I'm consuming REST services. So what happens if I say paste? What? It actually created a class for that root object, because again, that root object doesn't have a name, so it's just calling it root object. So if we go back to Postman for a minute, Let's do the pretty version. We'll see that this root object has an ID and a name and a full name and an owner. And we'll see those same things, ID, name, full name, owner. But because this owner was a complex object, it went ahead and created a class that represented the owner as well. And it'll walk down that chain as many times as it needs to in order to create these classes so that you can essentially, let's call this my repo result or whatever you want to call it. Then I can call GitHub in this case and then serialize, convert a JSON result directly to a repo result and it'll walk down all those classes it created. This becomes really uh, simple to go ahead and consume JSON results with. So those are some tips about class creation, type creation that I use on a pretty daily basis when I'm working with Visual Studio.
If you want to see more videos, you can come to my YouTube channel where I have a number of free videos under seanw.me slash wildervideos. And you can also see my plural site videos at seanw.me slash psauthor. Thanks for watching.